Um, good morning. Uh, this subject, what is modern in modern art, has suddenly, has suddenly become one that people are doing a lot of research into. It's, a very, it, it's suddenly become a learned subject which very learned people write about. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to talk about it in rather a general way. Um, uh, I hope, though, that I won't be too misleading. I suppose one of the works, one, one of the recent publications which connects with some of the things I'm going to say is a book called The Tradition of the Modern, which is a large anthology by Richard Ellman and Feidelson. And to, to, to some extent, I mean, anyone who's interested in this could find a good deal of the background material by looking at that book. I think the first thing that rather stri strikes one about the modern, a modern style, is that we all know what it is. It's rather like, you know, people who say they don't know anything about art, but they know what they like. And a lot of people would say, uh, uh, we, we know what is modern and we know we don't like it. Because there is very decidedly an immediately recognizable modern style. And what I want to discuss is really basically why, and what I want to analyze is why things look modern and read modern. Because I'm going to talk about literature, uh, poetry, as well as uh, more than uh, a painting. I think that if you, when, you, when you apply the word modern to architecture, to uh, furniture, and so on, um, what, what one means is that uh, this thing, this building, or this chair, or table, or whatever it is, uh, seems to turn its back on the past. It seems to break with conventions and traditions. And it's, at the same time, it seems to have a particular kind of relationship with the present. I think those are the two things by, by which one, two signs by which one immediately recognizes the modern the break with the past, and a kind of confrontation with a world uh, which doesn't have much to do with the past. So that the two essential primary elements are here, the break with the past and the confrontation with the present. And everything, all the varieties of the modern, and there are good many, as well as I'll be able to show, there are good many different kinds of modern development, they're all connected, really, with these two things, the attitude of the modern towards the past and also the attitude of the uh, modern towards the present. Um, but as a matter of fact, it's just about these two things on which the modern movement tends to split. Uh, the modern movement, uh, the, 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 let's take, first of all, uh, the break with the past. Because the moment one thinks about the break with the past, it's clear, I think, that modern artists are divided into those who want a complete break with the past and those who want, rather, instead of this, to have a different attitude towards the past or, as it were, to try to f discover a new kind of past. Um, I think that in his last book of criticism, The Critic on the Critic, which has just been published, Eliot says that uh, in the history of modern art, uh, modern literature, I suppose, he's thinking of particularly, uh, when a new work appears, and he's undoubtedly thinking, say, of the early poetry of T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound, and he's probably thinking of James Joyce's Ulysses, uh, when the new work appears, is denounced by everyone as being completely new and having no connection with the, what, with the past whatever. And then, later on, people discover more and more that so far from being a break with the past, it in fact is attached, it arises from the past and itself becomes part of a long line of the tradition. 
Um, so in, in saying this, Eliot is, is expressing very much his own point of view, because there is uh, as a, a completely different kind of modern art, which really does make a complete break with the past. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But that is what is called, what I will try to call futurism. Uh, but, what, but in most cases, in the case of the works, of the, which in the early part of the century, like Eliot's early poetry and Pound's poetry and James Joyce's uh, Ulysses, what looked like a complete break with the past turned out merely to be that the modern artist, the modern writer, had gone back to a different past from the kind of past which his contemporaries uh, were choosing. Um, if you think of the beginning of uh, in the early part of this century, the uh, writers in England whom Eliot and uh, Pound, when they came to England in at the, early in the, part, at the early part of the century, 1907, 1909, and that kind of thing, these writers who, were, who regarded themselves as traditional were traditional in the sense that they were writing very much in the manner of the writers who immediately preceded them. Well, they thought of tradition simply as continuity. And or again, one might say that they thought of tradition as simply being conventional. It's as though you put up a building, if you have to choose between two buildings, and you put up one that looks like a, a, Gothic, a, a, a Victorian Gothic cathedral, then you call this a traditional work of art. Uh, whereas if you put up one that looks like a Mexican temple and and you build it out of concrete, this looks like a complete break with tradition. But in fact, it could be argued that the, that the modern piece of architectural building that is simply in the line of the Gothic cathedral is a decadent, is not traditional except in the sense of being decadent, um, and, in the sen and, it, and in the sense of being conventional, that, it's imp that tradition, which was a powerful force, has become simply a mere matter of good manners, of conventions. So that when I say the, the modern artists have chosen a different past, I mean that, they, that instead of simply con carrying on in the conventions which are laid down by their immediate predecessors and which are supposed to continue in an unbroken order with the past, um, they are looking at, the par looking at the past and asking themselves what aspects or what lessons of the past uh, in past works are valuable to us. So that what they are doing is their, or valuable to them in their work, what they're doing is breaking not with the whole of tradition, but with the overt continuity of what is almost unreflectingly assumed to be traditional in their time. And this turns out often, I think, to be mere conventionalism. I think an important distinction one ought to bear in mind is between conventionalism and traditionalism. So what often turns out to have happened is not that there is an anti-traditional, completely revolutionary art, but that there has been a revolution in the idea of what is meant by the tradition. And there, in history, of course, there, in past history, there have been other examples of artists doing that. In fact, you might make a broad generalization and say that nearly always uh, what is new is going back to the past. What is new is, look, is, is simply choosing an aspect of the past which uh, most contemporaries have ignored. And if you go back into the 19th century, you see there was a, a, a movement of this kind called Pre-Raphaelitism. Pre um, the Victorian Pre-Raphaelites, 
uh, paint painters like Holman Hunt, Millet, and so on, who started the Pre-Raphaelite movement, um, they looked at the painting round them, and they thought that the painting that was being done round them was merely a, a decadence, a, a decadent continuation of the rather sumptuous manner of the late Renaissance. And so they wanted to go back to something much more simple and much more primitive. And so they went back to the primitive early painters, Italian painters, before Raphael. And they, uh, they, they invented the movement which is called Pre-Raphaelitism. And when Eliot, Pound, and Joyce started writing, uh, it looked as, uh, to the critics of that time as if they had made a complete break with tradition. But what they had really done was to go back to the past. Uh, for instance, um, to Dante, to the poetry of Chaucer, and to the poetry of, of, of Dan. And uh, when one looks at the whole of the uh, great movement, uh, the great modern movement, which took place at the beginning of this century, uh, in all the arts, one sees there's the same tendency to turn away from mere continuity and to go back into what is, uh, a, seems a rather remote and almost forgotten past. Uh, and to turn it into something which is modern. For instance, uh, an outstanding example, of course, is Picasso, because Picasso uh, shocked his uh, contemporaries uh, in 1910 or so by going, by, by going back to uh, primitive art. He went back to, the pr to, to even more primitive than that which the pre-Raphaelites went at, uh, back to, to primitive uh, European art, particularly Catalan painting. But he also went to quite other, diff other sources. For instance, he went back to, uh, to Negro art, to African art. And um, when a movement like Cubism, which seemed completely new, uh, was, near, was really partly going back to Byzantine art, that's to say, the kind of art which is not representational, but which tries to uh, both visualize uh, uh, ideas and treat them in an abstract and highly stylized uh, kind of way. So that far more often than most people realize, uh, what looks new in art is really going back into a past tradition. But there, however, there have been, and this is, is where I, I was suggesting that there's been a, there's a split in the modern movement, which has become more and more today a split between painting and literature. Um, there have been, and there still are, modernists who really do want to break with the past and who want to break with the whole of the tradition. Um, so that in contrast with the kind of writers, the kind of artists I've been talking about, who simply had a revolutionary view of tradition, whom I call, would call the revolutionary traditionalists, they are the artists who call themselves the futurists. Or anyhow, there was a group of artists uh, 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 working in, about, in Italy in about 1914 who called themselves futurists. And the name is so use, is very useful because it represents a whole tendency and it can be applied to a lot of other artists. It can be applied to Dadaists, perhaps to Surrealists, uh, and perhaps to uh, 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 pop artists and op artists and people like that. Uh, the aim of the futurists was to break with the past completely. Uh, they didn't want to go back to any past tradition uh, because what they, what they thought was that modern life is completely different from all past, or from life as it's been lived in the past, and therefore modern art must be totally and completely different from uh, the art of the past. What the uh, writers like 
Elliot and Pound and Joyce thought was that although modern art is, uh, modern life is very different from the past, uh, modern life is, is also desperately in need of the past. And so therefore you have to go, as it were, hunting through the past and trying to find examples of writing, attitudes, uh, which are highly relevant to modern life. Um, for instance, uh, I'm talking now, I'm going back to the revolutionary traditionalists. For instance, uh, the Victorians didn't seem at all helpful to writers at the beginning of this century because the Victorian poets who were in the tradition of the Roma were a continuation of the Romantic poets in the early part of the 19th century, had an extremely conventional idea of the kind of subject matter which could go into poetry. It had to be a romantic subject matter, and it had to be written in a romantic style. Well, the poets early on in this century discovered that if, you write, if, that if they accepted these conventions, that they could only write about, in the, they could only write poetry about a very few of the things which actually interested them and which they actually experienced in life. Uh, a notable example of this is Yeats, who in his early poetry, which is called the Celtic Twilight Poetry, could only write uh, this sort of mis mis mystic, uh, half partly symbolist, uh, romantic kind of poetry, which was very beautiful, but which, as Yeats himself discovered, had less and less to do with the life that really interested Yeats, because Yeats was concerned with Irish politics, he was concerned with running a theater, and all the gossip of Dublin, and all the kind of business and complications um, and embroilments which come from trying to do something like run a theater in a modern city. But according to his own idea of poetry, he couldn't put any of these things which were his day-to-day -day preoccupations into poetry. So in fact, he found himself writing less and less poetry. And the poetry he did write was really about more or less marginal experiences. Well then, as is well known, Ezra Pound became his secretary. And Ezra Pound, uh, in 1916, and Ezra Pound started going over uh, Yeats's poems in a rather intolerant way, and pointing out to him how the, the word, the language that he used was over-poetic, and how he could replace this over-poetic language by a much more modern kind of language. And thus, by writing a more modern kind of language, um, Yeats was able to write about the things that interested him much more. So that Yeats developed from a minor Victorian, uh, late Victorian poet into a major 20th century poet through this revolutionizing of his style. But at the same time, Pound was going back through English literature, trying to find what in English literature, uh, what attitudes, what kind of writing in English literature, and in fact in European literature altogether, could be usefully and helpfully uh, uh, used in the contemporary world. And he found, for instance, Chaucer, because Chaucer is a, suffers from no inhibitions. Uh, Chaucer discusses everything. Chaucer uses highly colloquial language of his time. He preferred Chaucer to uh, Shakespeare because Shakespeare though, of course, the greatest poet and all that, um, is a bad habit. He's become no one, if you think of the history of English uh, poetry, one realizes that English history is one of the most dramatic, uh, 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 is full of the most marvelously and interesting um, dr uh, 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 dramatic uh, stories. I mean, like the execution of Charles I, uh, Rawley's Last Voyage. You know, one can think of hundreds of things that could make marvelous plays, poetic dramas, 
but it's impossible to write a poetic drama since Shakespeare that wouldn't be an imitation of Shakespeare because the magnetism, the hypnotic hold of Shakespeare over our imaginations is so great. If one thinks of the, uh, say, the execution of Charles I and starts thinking of putting it into a poetic drama, one immediately thinks, ah, oh, five acts and uh, great speeches just before his head's chopped off and things like that. One immediately starts thinking one can't get away from the obsession uh, with Shakespeare. So that that is the point of choosing a different kind of past. And on the whole, the poets early in this century chose either a brutal or, or, or rough, anyhow, straightforward, candid uh, past like that of Chaucer, or, and, 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 I should say, or stroke and, uh, a past, the examples of poets who were extremely intellectual, who were able to think, to write poetry which thinks and doesn't just feel, uh, or thinks as well as feels, like John Donne, uh, like Pope and Dryden, and so on. But now, as talking about the futurists, the futurists, as I say, had a program for breaking with tradition completely and inventing a new art which wasn't influenced by or in any way an extension of the past, but which was based entirely on the experience on immersing themselves in unprecedented phenomena of modern life, which in 1916 were usually the results of the petroleum engine, aeroplanes, fast automobiles, machinery, and so on. Also modern warfare, of course. So that they plunge, they immerse themselves in this environment of the modern industrial world, which, so far from being connected with the past, seems a complete break with the past. And it's significant that the leaders of the, of the surrealist movement, uh, Marinetti, Severini, and people like that were all Italians because they regarded, uh, uh, living in Italy, they regarded Italy as a kind of museum, a huge museum visited by tourists. And uh, the first thing that the, sir, the, the, uh, sir, the futurists wanted to do was to blow up all the, the public buildings in Italy and then start an entirely new Italy, um, which was based on the experience of the modern world. They wanted to, be, to break off all connection with the past. Um, they wanted to have what Wyndham Lewis, the critic and, and vorticist uh, painter, later called a kind of art which is rooted in the future. Um, as opposed to a kind of art which is rooted in the past. Um, and this is what futurism was. It was art rooted in the future. And I think that there are a good many uh, movements which are basically fut futuristic. I think that futurism should be used in this rather technical sense, or in this rather definite sense, of meaning a kind of art, of, of applying to a kind of art which has no connection with the past whatever. Of course, it's impossible really quite to do that, but I mean, this is an aim, a program. And for example, Dadaism and Surrealism um, were this kind of art. And from there, there, them come the whole idea today of happenings, events, and so on. Because a happening is something which has no past and also no future. Um, it just happens, and uh, yet in some way it's, it's an expression which takes a kind of, uh, of, mo of momentary artistic form. It's an ex what it's really doing is it's, it's, re it's cutting out the continuity of art and reducing art to a pure ex and immediate experience which comes out of nothing and goes back into nothing. And one can see 
why. One can see that the people, the futurists and the Dadaists and the people who go in for events and happenings, what they, ex they object to is the whole kind of continuity of art um, with a whole world of conventions and conformism and traditions and so on. In fact, everything which makes art respectable. As um, Harold Rosenberg was saying the other day when I heard him speak somewhere, um, today, on the one hand, you think of painters, on the one hand, painters are trying to paint um, paintings which shock. But on the other hand, museums and collectors are occupied in buying up these paintings and make, making them respectable. Because the moment they're framed and put in a museum, or even not framed, but stuck in a museum, they become, it's as though brackets are put around them, and they're called art, instead of being something which immediately hits the spectator. And they're immediately put in the context of other works of art, which bored people um, uh, look at in a sort of weary kind of way, while they, while they wander through public galleries. And so, it's the attempt to turn art into an immediate shock, an immediate experience, um, rather than uh, it's having any kind of continuity. But, of course, um, this kind of anti-art art of demonstrations, events, happenings, and so on, uh, produces a great deal of confusion because it follows from it that it cannot be judged by the standards by which critics judged works of art in the past. So that, in fact, I mean, even if you call it art, you're already using a word which relates it to the past and applying standards which relate it uh, to the past. And this is misleading. Maybe it ought to be called something completely different. And the result, I think the result of the futuristic tendency of modern painting, uh, because modern painters are particularly interested, I think, in making paintings which, so far from being connected with the past, um, have nothing to do with the past. And the result of this is that there's the very great confusion of vocabulary, which is uh, particularly applicable, uh, noticeable in art criticism. Because it's the, the art critic, you see, the moment he says something is beautiful, he is saying that something, a painting by Rauschenberg, is beautiful in the same sense as a painting by Piero de la Francesca, say, is beautiful. Well, the question then is, does it really have anything whatever to do with the painting which was done in the 15th century? It either has or it hasn't. If it has, then, of course, it's very important to point out the connection. But if it hasn't, the application of the word beautiful becomes very misleading because it's just a way of making it seem respectable and, and putting it back into the frame of the whole of art, um, a whole past history of art. And thus one finds modern artists perpetually really preoccupied with trying to get away from these standards for instance, uh, trying to uh, 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 trying simply to take, say, a Coca-Cola bottle or something like that, and put it on a stand, and say, "This is a work of art because I have selected it and put it on a stand." Um, although it has no, it's it's a visual object. It's something that I have singled out from a f the flow of all the things around us and made you look at not just as a Coca-Cola bottle, but as something which I have chosen. And in this way, and also it's been chosen because, simply because it is not a work of art, because it's a kind of anti-art uh, visual object. But nevertheless, futurism isn't the main direction of the modern movement, perhaps not even in painting, and certainly not in uh, literature. Nevertheless, for, uh, so, so that for, most, for the most part, the arguments which are produced in favor of the great masterpieces of modern art do in fact appeal to the past, because, these, because they, we are not discussing uh, uh, with most modern arts, 
um, futurism at all. We're discussing works which are profoundly traditional. But in painting, uh, this past is much more eclectic than in literature. Um, thus, Picasso's work uh, relates not only to the history of Catalan and Spanish painting uh, and to the French Revolution uh, to, and to the French 19th century, but also to things like paintings on Greek vases, to primitive African sculpture, and so on. In fact, a modern painting relates, when it is traditional, uh, relates to the whole history of the visual arts. And um, Andre Malro has ha, ha, calls this the the musée imaginaire, the imaginary museum. The point really is that, where, that there is a great difference there, that, uh, today between the painter and the writer. And this difference is perhaps due to an absolutely practical reason. And that is that the, the writer can only read, or, or with few exceptions, reads mostly in his own, work in his own language. And therefore, uh, when, when he is looking for examples of work in the past on which to base his own writing, his choice is comparatively limited to examples of his own language. He's only, he's only really exposed to a fairly limited and selected past, however arbitrary and perverse his selection from it may seem. But owing to uh, reproductions, owing to the reproduction of works of art, um, we are all exposed, and painters, of course, particularly, and owing to the existence of museums and the, uh, the fact that people can travel about fairly easily, we are all exposed to all, uh, to, uh, to the whole history of past art. It's, uh, if you think back, in the 19th century, someone like Goethe had been to Rome, but he'd never been to Athens. He'd only seen uh, very bad imitations of Greek art, for instance. Well, any of us in this room knows far, this has seen far more examples of the art of the whole of the past of the world's history than anyone living 50 years had done. And so this means that modern art, of course, uh, modern art is influenced by this. And uh, w when they are traditional, uh, or when they are going back to the past, uh, they are extremely eclectic, much more than uh, modern writers. But just to name a few of the masters of the modern mov movement gives us an idea of the time in history and the aims of its masters, uh, both in relation to the present and to the past. So that in a broad conspectus, as distinct from the futurists whom I've been talking about, um, one might name uh, these masters of revolutionary traditionalism, Cezanne, Picasso, Braque, Matisse in painting, uh, Stravinsky, Berg, and Bartok in music, Joyce, Pound, and Elliot in poetry. And the more one studies the work of, of any of these, the more one sees that it relates to the past. And what they had done, it, it, it now seems clear that what they had done was to break the line of tradition, which is mere imitative continuity, the good manners of conventional behavior as applied to the arts, and to release the past at those points where it seemed, as it were, to have most to say to the present, into the present, not as continuity, but as a kind of vision. So that reading the letters of Ezra Pound, one sees that Ezra Pound is always thinking when he looks back on the past of how a dead writer might enable him to become in the present a more living one. And the dead writer, above all, has firstly to discuss a wide range of living experience, and secondly, he has to exercise analytic powers in converting that experience into poetry in a way which is useful to the present. Um, but in the pursuit of their past, though, 
these writers were always conscious of the necessity of being modern. So that when Pound first writes to Harriet Mon Munro about T.S. Eliot, he describes um, Eliot as a poet who has learned to modernize his style. Uh, modernization becomes a key, is a key word. I don't think anyone now is particularly occupied in modernizing their style, but uh, 50 years ago, modernizing uh, was, a, was a key word, really. And as I said, uh, uh, Pound uh, taught Yeats to modernize his style, and Yeats was extremely conscious of this. And in fact, the great artists at the beginning of this century in the modern movement, which was a kind of international, which is really an international movement, were fighting on two fronts. On the one hand, they were trying to be traditionalist and to get back into the tradition. And on the other hand, they were conscious, consciously trying to be modern. So they were trying to get back into the past and to be modern. And I think it's the tension, really, between these two aims uh, which seem opposite at first sight, um, which makes their work so impressive. The reason why one is interested in James Joyce and not specially interested in Gertrude Stein is because James Joyce was trying all the time to be both a great classical and at the same time a great modern writer, whereas Gertrude Stein was simply occupied in trying to invent a, a modern style. So now, um, apart from the, te from the technical aspects of writing, what does modernize mean? What is the distinctly modern style? I suggested when I began that the modern style is one which the reader or the looker or the listener immediately recognizes. Why? The reason why, I think, is that it's a style which has been allowed to become qualified, to become created by the conditions which surround it. The artist, the role of the artist has somehow been to allow um, the conditions, which are the conditions of modern life, to influence his work, uh, to influence the words he uses, the forms he paints, and so on, his techniques even. It's modern, therefore, a modern style is modern to a great extent in exactly the same way as something quite functional, like the wing of an aeroplane is modern, because the aeroplane's wing's design is submitted to laws of aerodynamics, um, and so on. Um, uh, uh, it's conditioned by the air, or by the circumstances of the air and the weather and so on, through which the aeroplane actually has to fly. So that the conditions, these con so that if you say, for instance, that an aeroplane is a very beautiful thing, you don't really mean the same thing as if you said that a cathedral was very beautiful because you realize that the role of the cathedral, of the architect in the uh, designing a cathedral is different from the role of the, um, um, uh, of, of the aircraft uh, designer in designing the airplane. Because in designing the airplane may be a beautiful object, but it has to be conditioned by the circumstances in which it flies. There's very little room for the personal expression of the designer, designer the designer becomes, as it were, a medium, an interpreter of conditions he recognizes rather than someone who expresses himself. If there was a sort of great aeroplane designer who wanted to build a very, uh, a design, uh, an aeroplane which expressed his personality, one wouldn't want to fly in it very much. I don't mean, though, by this that modern art is functional, though there was a sort of one of the branches of futurism was functionalism, the idea that a work of art should simply be functional or, or, or should simply be modeled on the idea of function which you find, for instance, in an airplane. But what I do mean is that the modern artist is one who is very aware of the conditions of modern life, 
and of the necessity of inventing a work of art as if it were a machine of words and paints or music which can uh, travel through these conditions, which, which at every point accepts and recognizes and relates to these conditions. This finally becomes more important than that the modern artist should express his personality. And thus you find in Eliot's early criticism, that he's always insisting that the artist shouldn't be personal, shouldn't express his personality. He's much more interested that the artist, that the poet, should write a poem which reflects somehow a consciousness of the way in which our sense of rhythm has been affected by the noise of the petroleum engine than that he should express his personality. In poetry, one of the first conditions, then, is the poem has to be des des de designed to move through an envir a modern environment of towns, of scientific inventions, of uh, abstract thinking, and so on, in which people speak modern speech about modern ideas. The poets realized quite early on that a modern poem has to reflect uh, the conditions, the circumstances in which we speak modern language. Because modern language, after all, the language that we all speak here in this room, is the medium in which we live our speaking and thinking and dreaming lives. And even if it's quite a debased medium, nevertheless, the po this is the medium in which the poem has to fly, has to float, just as the air is the medium in which the airplane has to fly. And so the objection to conventional poetry of the kind that was written in English and America, uh, England and America early in this century was that it didn't move into modern life, but that it moved in a world of past poetry. This awareness of the necessity to create an art, in, to invent an art object which meets uh, modern conditions takes us very far. Um, for instance, as I just said, it leads to a certain depersonalization. Depersonalization because it's felt that modern life itself has led to a certain depersonalization. A modern man is no longer aware of himself in, this, in the same way as people were in the past, of having a soul, of being alone with his God, of having a fixed place in society in defined circumstances of family, um, neighbors, and so on, uh, living rituals in life, so that his, pers his own personality becomes um, a, 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 something which radiates outwards. Modern man is much more than, uh, uh, on the surface, modern man is is a socially conditioned unit with tastes provided for him by the ad advertising he reads, functions provided by, for him by the employment which he has, and so on. And so that, so that he doesn't, so that uh, modern men don't even think of themselves quite as persons in the way that people did in the past. What we do think of ourselves, though, is as, as it were, surfaces or people moving on a surface who nevertheless have within them sort of untapped sources of strength. Um, we, we, we're much more interested in, as it, today in our unconsciousness, perhaps, than we are than in our conscious personalities, because we realize that we have a great a source of strength and individuality in our, the working of our unconscious mind, um, whereas we may more or less have given up on the level of our conscious mind. Um, so that recognizing this, we find that in the modern novels by writers like Joyce and Lawrence, um, characters, the characters in these novels are not at all like characters are not at all characters divide, uh, defined in terms of the community, the little societies in which they live, as in, say, Jane Austen or Dickens. On the contrary, the, the characters of 
D.H. Lawrence, for instance, on the surface are rather brittle because a character becomes not so much a, a monument recognizable at once from the outside as an opening into forces of subconscious instinct um, which lie below the level of what Lawrence himself calls the fixed ego of the uh, novelistic personality. So, where we are now um, looking at the scene of the arts today, one has the impression that in literature the modern movement has largely ceased to exist. It tends to rest on its achievements and which are to have invented idioms, forms, in which writers can express the whole range of modern experience. Uh, struggles still go on, as it were, of the outposts. For instance, uh, the struggle to invent a kind of American verse which is different from the whole English tradition. And, uh, for instance, the attack on censorship, the demand that, that people will be able to say anything and describe anything in novels. But I suggest that the modern movement has ceased to advance in literature because, as a matter of fact, its objectives were limited by language itself. Uh, a, a writer can't go on in reinventing the medium of language the, because the medium of language, uh, uh, however different modern language may be from past language, nevertheless, language is a profoundly conservative thing. Um, uh, painters and new composers are in the position, unlike writers, that the, that the medium, which mediums which they use, can go on being reinvented constantly because, uh, to all intents and purposes, they exist simply for the purpose of creating the work of art. So, for this re reason, painting continues to be avant garde, partly because the medium which painters use is continually being changed, and partly because the categories categories of criticism have been so broken by the futuristic tendencies of modern painting that there's really no check on painters. They uh, go, go uh, 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 critics are reduced to simply, if you read criticisms of an exhibition of modern painting, you find, if you analyze what the critic's really saying, he's really simply describing what the painter does. Um, without, in a rather technical, technical kind of way, without really saying anything about it in nine cases out of ten, or simply saying that within the limits of this technique, uh, painter A uh, uses uh, polythene or whatever it is slightly better than painter B. But the whole thing is produced really to a purely technical discussion. Um, the attempt to relate uh, modern art to the past history of art has almost... Uh, ceased. So that with literature one tends to say that the modern was, with painting one goes on tending to say that it is. It seems now then that the aim of modern literature was to invent a language of discourse which made it possible for the poet and novelist to write about pre the preoccupations of people living our contemporary lives. Um, and which do not form the subject of past literature. And also a secondary preoccupation of poets and novelists was to keep lifelines of, of contemporary writing open with the history of past literature. But the aims of painting and sculpture, sculpture were divided. They were partly perhaps to do this, but they were partly futuristic, simply to invent something new. And this has led to a great state of confusion, uh, so that painting seems to be an art today which is, uh, which is su subjected to a kind of r rule of perpetual revolution. Um, this has its danger, dangers. I think that modern poets have found it almost too easy to write about anything. Their poetry has become too easily, too facilely, discursive, discursive. What it lacks is intensity and concentration and power and those things. 
It's become too easy to write about anything, and the result is that everyone does write about anything. Um, but modern painting, on the other hand, um, has become too unpredictable. Um, if you, if you would, if I, if someone was pointed out to me in this room and I was told he was a young painter, I wouldn't know what it meant at all. Um, if I knew he was a writer, if I was, if if I was, uh, he's pointed out to me as a young poet, I'd know that he was a poet who, probably, I'd know, I'd guess that he was a poet who had invented a style in which he could easily r write about anything that happened to interest him, and he probably did this much too easily, in fact. But with a, if, I, if it was a modern painter, I simply wouldn't know, because modern painting has achieved a condition of total unpredictability. Thank you. <laughs>